China's in transition. And it is a transition from an old economy to a new economy. It's something that the US went through in stages over 40 or 50 years. It's something China's trying to do in 15 or 20. So things are very chaotic. If you simply look at retail in the United States, in the 1980s up until about 1995, a 20-year period, the entire retail infrastructure in the United States was rebuilt and modernized. So e-commerce, when it evolved in the United States, was actually competing with large established players that offered a good shopping experience. China, e-commerce has exploded because the shopping experience in China, there really hasn't been an opportunity to upgrade the physical shopping experience, the traditional shopping experience. E-commerce has come in and made it more convenient. And we'll talk a little bit about trust later too, which is something that uh, uh, e-commerce is allowed to do. If we think about at the very macro level, there are four main changes at the global level that are affecting China, and then there's some changes inside China. At the global level, the economic activity and dynamism is clearly moving to the developing world, emerging markets. In 2000, 95% of the Fortune 500 companies were in Europe, the United States, Japan, other developed markets. In 2025, McKinsey projects 50% of the Fortune, global Fortune 500 will be outside of the developed world. They'll be in the emerging markets. That is a phenomenal change in a very short period of time. We actually expect there to be more companies on that list from China than from the United States. So you think out over a 35 year, 25 year period, that kind of transition, it really has some very profound impacts on both the macro and micro uh, economic markets. The other thing that's happening is in the emerging markets, it's not just Shanghai, Beijing anymore. It's Chengdu, it's Foshan, it's Kunming. It's all these second tier markets, which many Westerners don't understand at all. That's a global phenomenon. That's not just a China phenomenon, but China's at the lead of that phenomenon. So not only if you're a foreign firm, are you having to think now about, well, you have to go to China, you have to go to India, you need to understand Africa. You have to understand more than the capital. You have to go in much, much deeper than before. Because that is really where the crux, really where the core of the dynamism and entrepreneurship is for many of those economies. The second major trend, which I won't talk much about, is demographics. Many of the world, the developed world is aging, except for the United States. Uh, the United States ultimately winds up a very lucky place in about 30 years. Um, China, it's, it's going to be interesting to see whether an aging demographic in China is positive or negative. It certainly is impacting labor rates, impacting labor costs. It'll be interesting to see where that uh, ends up. In terms of technology, technology accelerates in a nonlinear fashion. It accelerates in a geometric or exponential fashion. fashion. One of the things that we're seeing today, both the scope, scale, and economic impact of technology is at a rate we've never seen before. You're seeing it at the personal level. Forget the watch, forget the Apple Watch, the Pebble, whatever you happen to use. We've had multiple companies come in and talk to us about injectable chips that have all of your personal information, they track 20 different metabolic rates. Phenomenal things that are gonna be available in a very short period of time. The cynical response from one of my Chinese associates was, what happens if someone cuts off your hand and steals the chips. I was thinking that was really depressing, but the entrepreneur who was pitched said, oh no, we've thought of that. Without the blood flow, the chips don't work. <laughs> so, so, you know, so you think about the solutions or the opportunities, we're gonna live in a very, very different world. And the so the scope of the technology is gonna come very much, very, very personalized, and very, very much at a country and societal level. The other thing that Dr. Sai talked about were the flows, particularly the flows, not trade anymore where goods moved around. That's, that's interesting, but that's really not what's mattering today. What's mattering today is the flows of people. One example that doesn't have anything to do with technology or innovation, just the, tr the fact that 150 million, maybe 200 million Chinese leave China every year and go overseas, the profound impact that has on China. 
When Japan started going through that in the late 70s, it had a profound impact on Japan. You cannot have a quarter, 20% of your population traveling overseas and having them come home and not have that change everything. The Chinese will change everything they go out. It also changes China. Um, so the degree that the world is connected is the last one of these four major, uh, major drivers. In China, there are certain innovation drivers that we focus on. One is the privatization of the economy. So if I ask many of you, if you read the US press or if you read US policy briefings, you would think that China is a planned economy. Seriously. Um, if you look back over the last 30 years, 97% of the new jobs added in the economy are in private companies. 97%. Virtually 100% of all the profit growth is in private companies. So the job growth, the profit growth, now almost 52% of debt, the new debt that's being issued at the corporate level is being issued to private firms. I don't mean public or private in the sense of the stock market, I mean in terms of the real ownership, whether it's individuals or whether it's a state-owned enterprise. So this is not a planned economy. This is becoming more and more and more a very, very highly privatized uh, economy with still a long way to go and still huge risk factors in the state-owned sector, but this is really becoming a true market-driven private economy. When you look at the grand macro level, if you look at the Qiming portfolio, we see no evidence of economic slowdown. Um, we aggregate every year the revenues of all of our companies, the profits of all of our companies, the number of people that they, that they add. Last year, profits grew 270%. Sales grew almost 400%. The number of people hired grew about 300% within, the, within our universe. Those don't sound like numbers from a slowing economy. But again, that's because we're in a different part of the economy in China. It is now really two entirely different marketplaces, uh, the innovation marketplace and the uh, traditional marketplace. So what dri what's driving innovation in China? Phenomenally talented people. Phenomenally talented people. There's a very interesting study that the first stage has been done that won't be published for a little while, but the, the glimpse is that one of the criticisms from the Chinese education system in high school is you're not taught critical thinking, that you're only taught rote memorization. So let me correct that. They did a study, Stanford was involved in it, so they interviewed a whole bunch of students at Stanford, a whole bunch of students at about a dozen US universities, and about China, and East China Normal did the study in China at about a dozen universities in the majors of computer science and electrical engineering. Very preliminary work, just two majors. The Chinese students were ahead of American students coming out of very good high schools by two and a half years in critical thinking at the end of high school. So this is not a group of, this is an incredibly talented group of people. Now what's interesting is the Americans catch up in college. So after the second and third year, for many of the reasons that Dr. Tsai was talking about, the Americans start to catch up. And we've had our own experience with interns. We take 14 to 20 interns a year at Qi Ming. There's a whole swarm of them running around. We don't pay them much, so it's actually is a great deal for us. Um, but what will happen is undergraduates in the US will typically outperform in the same major, a graduate of a Chinese university. But by the end of the summer, or the end of six months working with us, they're the same. It really is that culture, it's the atmosphere, it's the environment, but the raw material is phenomenal. Um, if you start to look at the, you know, another thing that uh, drives innovation is money. So the venture capital industry in China, the innovation financing, is now second only to the United States. It's the only time so far in history where you've had a complete life cycle of innovation or venture capital, well, again, that's what I'm, the lens I'm looking through, available. Whether you've raised money in China, you find entrepreneurs in China, you build teams in China, you take a company public in China, and you liquidate your investment. You realize your investment in China. There's no other market on the world that operates anywhere near the scale of the United States except for China. This raises a very interesting point I'll get to later in terms of who's gonna be better suited to serve the rest of the world market, a Chinese entrepreneur or a US entrepreneur? So hold that thought. Um, I think that the other thing that China absolutely has a huge, uh, <laughs> you know, in a way it's a benefit, a lot of need, a lot of problems. 
Innovation looks for, or problems look for innovation, innovation looks for problems. So you have the people, you have the problems, you have the market demand, and you have the capital. And that's, gonna, that's what's starting to drive uh, the innovation. And we're seeing significant movement away from the copy uh, market uh, to companies doing things really that no one else in the world has done. Uh, last week, we had a group from Silicon Valley uh, called Singularity University which is a very futuristic think tank organization, and we paid for 10 of their professors to come and talk to all of our CEOs for a day and a half. It was fascinating, the debates that were going back and forth. And the Singularity folks said within their field, the people that they talked to in China were as good, so many cases better, than their counterparts in Silicon Valley. That was interesting. What they weren't as familiar with is looking at the broader perspective of what's actually happening in their business, what's actually happening in their market. Because when you think about it as a Chinese entrepreneur, every entrepreneur on the planet takes a lot of risk. You're on a windy road, you're driving at night at high speed. In China, you're driving in the fog. I cannot stress enough the importance and the barriers that the Chinese entrepreneurs deal with in terms of ambiguity. Are the rules going to be enforced today? Are the rules going to change tomorrow? So you become incredibly flexible. It raises all sorts of issues on values. That's for another talk. But it was, what it does do, it makes you very, very flexible, highly reactive, highly sensitive to your environment and how quickly you can change. So what we did last week was we gave presentations that caused this group to suddenly get out of their comfort zone and think about a much broader perspective for their business. It was really just a fantastic uh, thing to watch over the course of those days. One of the other things that we've noticed now in China is all of the contract manufacturing that drove a great deal of the technology investment and innovation in the 90s came around the concept of what I call JGE, which is just good enough. It was just good enough for the lowest possible price. So an American firm, European firm, would come to China, contract with Foxconn or some other firm, and they wanted just the absolute lowest possible price. So they'd get that, and they got the product equivalent with that. Well, over time, in China, the Chinese consumer's bar has been rising higher and higher, to where a Chinese consumer now doesn't really accept a lower quality product than their counterparts in the UK, Europe, Germany. They want the same level of product, and they still want it for that very, very low price. So what that's done is it's created an internal demand where the companies just have had to get better. So if we look across our portfolio, uh, one of the companies we invest in is a company called Face++. So in Silicon Valley today, at Google and Apple, the state-of-the-art technology for facial recognition is 97.5 to 98% accuracy. Face++ is at 99.5%. So better than Apple, better than Google, and they did it with a, an extremely efficient algorithm that no one else in the world had ever uncovered. That's actually, that wasn't copying anybody. That was just a bunch of really, really bright mathematicians getting together and figuring out how to do this. Um, there's a company, Xiaomi. Every talk I give, people want to talk about Xiaomi, so we'll talk about Xiaomi briefly. Xiaomi's innovation is not the phone. Xiaomi's innovation is being the first company that we've ever seen applying the leverage of their supply chain to other companies in their ecosystem. Apple could do this. They choose not to. But what Xiaomi's done is they go to all of their suppliers and they say, we want you to treat this new idea as if we've already shipped a million units of product. So the cost for the first product in the market is already the million and first unit cost. How do you compete with that? Incredibly innovative. But the challenge is you put your brand at risk. So what they've had to do, they had a product that they launched and the first results of the product were not positive. So Lei Jun, the founder, they basically worked 72 consecutive hours without sleep both the Xiaomi executive team and the startup executive team to fix this. Because it is about the product. It's about not having the old JGE mentality, but having the mentality of what's good enough for a 21st century Chinese consumer, Indian consumer, and so on. 
Um, another company that has, that's done doing some phenomenal technology, we have a very large healthcare practice. We have 41 companies in our healthcare portfolio. And I think it's the largest group in China investing in healthcare. And one of the companies that we invest in is a company called Neurotron, and they have a cochlear implant. So it's a surgically implanted hearing aid. They figured out a technology that can be implanted in infants as young as three years old. Unbelievable. No one else, no other company, cochlear in Australia, all the other leading firms, no one can come close to that. Not within two to three years of the same age. So again, forget about what, forget about the copying, forget about, there are now entrepreneurs that are both have the talent, the market opportunity, and the desire to build just phenomenally world-class next generation products. And you're gonna see more and more and more of that coming out of China. Uh, what can you expect to see in the future? Personalized medicine. China will absolutely lead the world in personalized medicine, lead the world in personalized medicine. Not even close. The two largest genome databases are in China. One's a company called BGI, another company is called Berry, Gen Berry Genomics. And they are doing phenomenal work. If you think about why would that happen in China first, it's the largest population of cancer patients on the planet, it's the largest population of diabetics on the planet. China will bankrupt the economy trying to handle its own lifestyle disease costs. So it has to both privatize and look for very, very aggressive technology solutions for those problems. Um, autonomous vehicles. I think if you live in China, you have a driver. So by definition, you already have an autonomous vehicle. It's just my, my autonomous vehicle's named Ken. And so uh, I think about, I've been, in China for ten, I've been in China for 10 years. I'm totally used to getting in a car and just showing up at where I'm supposed to go. Does it matter if there's a human being driving the car or not? I don't think so. And I think that in the developing market, if you're building a new city, are you really gonna spend 30, 40, 50% of your land to park cars? Why would you do that? So I think, again, you can look at some of these very, very large sea changes in technology occurring first in China and with Chinese technology, not simply borrowed or... Uh...